There's two major parts of the planet, water and dirt. Water and dirt are a bit different, so animals have adapted different strategies for thriving in different places. But some animals have adopted some similar strategies. For instance, both ancient terrestrial titanosaurs and the contemporary blue whale adapted the strategy of being big. In fact, some would argue they're the biggest. At a cosmic scale, of course, all life on Earth is pretty tiny and insignificant. But since Little League soccer teams can give best player awards to the toddler who threw the fewest temper tantrums out on the field, we can crown some Earthlings as the least tiny and insignificant. Blue whales are the first to receive this crown. They're the largest animals to exist, well, ever. I know, I know. It's shocking to think that there's a creature alive today bigger than the mighty and majestic mouse, but it's true. The average length of a mature female blue whale, the larger of the sexes, is between 24 and 28 meters depending on the subspecies. The so-called pygmy blue whales are still 21 meters long on average, which is as long as a five-story building is tall. The longest scientifically measured blue whale clocked in at 29.9 meters long. That is longer than 300 mice in a row. But every part of the blue whale is huge. Their tongue is about as long as a grown man is tall. Even the parts of it you think would be small are still huge. A chihuahua could wriggle through their blowhole and even some of their major arteries. A blue whale's aorta is the diameter of a dinner plate. And since a blue whale's heart is the size of a small car, a chihuahua could use it to recreate the infamous convertible scene from Beverly Hills Chihuahua. Except with a whole lot more blood. And I mean a lot more blood. An average adult blue whale has about 2,500 gallons of blood. That's enough blood to fill almost 60 barrels. Imagine one of those barrels getting blasted out during a cowboy shootout scene. That would be horrifying. And of course, blue whales are monstrously massive. Their newborns alone weigh around 2,700 kilograms, which is the same as a fully grown adult hippo. And the adults clock in between 150,000 and 190,000 kilograms, which is the same as six to seven and a half million adult mice. Although the blue whale reigns as queen when it comes to the largest animal of all time, there are actually some dinosaurs that are believed to have been longer than them. Sauropods, the group known for members like Brachiosaurus and Brontosaurus, boasted the largest animals known to have ever lived on the land. The group is known for long necks and long tails, and you know what they say about someone who's got a long tail. That's right, sauropods are also renowned for their comically small heads. Brachiosaurus, for instance, had a skull less than a meter long even though their body would have reached between 18 and 21 meters. That'd be like a fully grown man having a head the size of a Blockbuster gift card. But Brachiosaurus, as long as a pygmy blue whale, wasn't even the biggest of all the sauropods. During the Cretaceous period, a subgroup of sauropods called Titanosaurs emerged. The largest among them, Patagotitan Maiorum, was supposedly as long as 467 gift card size decapitated heads, meaning that scientists estimate they grew up to 40 meters long. That's as long as four of those extra-long Hummer limos, and two Hummer H1s longer than the longest blue whale ever measured. And to add to their incredible length, they are thought to have towered around 21 meters tall, which is about as tall as a large Brachiosaurus was long. But keep in mind that the exact size of these monsters is really difficult to estimate due to the incompleteness of their remains. That being said, there is still some controversy over whether the previously mentioned Patagotitan Maiorum is larger than other known titanosaurs, like Argentinosaurus or the delightfully named Dreadnoughtus. But despite the squabbling, we can all accept that those were some pretty big critters. There's also some controversy over just how much exactly some of these giant titanosaurs weighed. However, most estimates have put their mass under half the mass of even a male blue whale, which is why blue whales wear the crown of largest animal period. But how exactly are scientists making these estimates when they only have fragments of the remains? Actually, how do they even estimate the weight of any dinosaur for that matter? Well, it's pretty simple. If you use advanced interrogation techniques on any thing for long enough, it'll tell you whatever you want to know. And by advanced interrogation techniques, I mean, of course, math, not waterboarding. Although I'm not necessarily saying the scientists shouldn't at least try waterboarding fossils. Anyway, it actually is fairly simple. The heftier an animal is, the thicker its bones will need to be to support it. And luckily, there's people in the world who just happen to have a bunch of bones. And no, I'm not talking about babies with their unfused skulls. Some scientists measured a whole bunch of leg bones from still living creatures. Well, the leg bones of dead creatures from still living species. They didn't, like, stick a ruler in the leg of a living elk. From there, they compared a creature's mass against measurements of its leg bones and came up with a pretty cool graph. They looked at the graph and thought, hey, that kind of looks like a straight line. We could perform a linear regression on that. So linearly regressed they did. They came up with this formula. 
which we can use to estimate the body mass of long dead creatures from just the measurements of their bones. Even just fragments of their bones works too. From this formula, the researchers estimated that their Bronchiosaurus bronchi specimen was 35,780 kilograms, plus or minus about 9,000 kilograms. I know, I know, that's a big range, but it's better than what scientists were doing before, where they glanced down at a Patasaurus skeleton and said, eh. That looks like it'd be about as heavy as like, eh, I don't know, 14 giraffes? Now, we can just plug in the measurements of an Argentinosaurus' leg bones into a TI-84 and realize they're 55.55 giraffes heavy, give or take about 5 giraffes, which is, in metric, about 45,000 kilograms. Alright, so now we know, at least roughly, how big these behemoths got. So now let's move on to the real question of how these guys, both blue whales and sauropods, got so insanely big. Since sauropods and blue whales are such different creatures, they of course got big for very different reasons. But there are some minor uniting factors. Having a big body simply comes with some big advantages. Not only can you impress the ladies by grabbing cans of soup from the top shelf at Target, but having a bigger body thwarts predators, like cans of soup falling off from the top shelf at Target. Also, a bigger body means a bigger digestive system, which means that food will take longer to go through the digestive system, thus extracting more nutrients from the food. Ultimately, this means they can take advantage of food sources other critters aren't capable of capitalizing on. And this is part of the reason why sauropods develop such long necks. Or, more accurately, this is how their long necks help them develop such a big body. A big body with a bigger digestive system capable of digesting nutrient-poor leaves and twigs, plus a long neck to reach said leaves and trees like no other creature, could make sauropods the kings of the jungle. Although, there is actually some debate over whether sauropods were tree feeders like giraffes with tall upright necks, or whether they held them out horizontally so they looked more like a snake that was on stage or if they perhaps even held them in loop-de-loops, making balloon animals sort of shapes out of their necks. Personally, I think that last option is the most likely, but every scientist I've ever talked to about it ardently disagrees. Many also disagree that sauropods would have been physically capable of holding their necks completely upright. They argue that, based off of contemporary animals who hold their necks high like emus and ostriches, sauropods would have needed incredibly high blood pressure to get all of that blood up into their head. You see, a giraffe has a systolic blood pressure of 280 millimeters of mercury to pump blood to their heads, which is twice what is found in healthy humans. But scientists estimate that it would take a blood pressure of 700 millimeters of mercury to pump the blood up to the head of sauropods. This blood pressure would be fatal to any warm-blooded creature. Plus, in order to pump blood that hard, a sauropod would need an enormous heart. It would need to be 15 times the size of a whale's heart of equivalent body size. However, the opposite extreme of a horizontal neck also seems unlikely after studying the shoulder anatomy of sauropods more extensively. So, it's most likely that most sauropods held their necks up at a slight incline, making a 45 degree or so angle with their neck on the ground. Although scientists still think some sauropods, in particular Brachiosaurus and Diplodocids, still held their necks completely upright. And some sauropods actually held their necks almost horizontally, like Apatosaurus's. There hasn't yet been any evidence of sauropods holding their necks like tied shoelaces, but I'm still holding out for it. Now interestingly, there is some evidence that sauropods with horizontally held necks might have still been treetop feeders. These dinosaurs could rear up on their hind legs. Apatosaurus and Diplodocids had their center of mass directly over their hips, and some of their tail vertebrae had shapes specialized to bear weight, implying they would use their tail like a third leg for stability while rearing up. These dinos might have reared up for a myriad of reasons, but it's not unlikely they used their dexterity to get at food in high up places. However sauropods use their long necks, they gave them a multifaceted advantage. Whether sauropods grazed ground vegetation or else browsed up in the trees, they could reach more of it more efficiently. Whether the critters simply moved their necks around to graze flora or only had to slightly move their bodies to munch from bush to bush, their long necks helped save the creatures energy by reducing how much they had to move to browse. And of course, sauropods would have needed to eat a lot. It's estimated that Apatosaurus ate around 100 pounds of foliage like twigs and leaves per day in order to maintain their size. For reference, the average person eats just about 0 pounds of twigs per day. And besides for their necks, sauropods had another adaptation that let them get so big. Their respiratory system. First and foremost, their lungs were incredibly efficient. They had lungs similar to the ones we see in modern day birds. Avian lungs are unidirectional. That means the air only flows one way through the system, so inflowing oxygen-rich air doesn't get knocked out of the way by outflowing oxygen-poor air like it does in our bidirectional lungs. Not only that, but oxygen-rich air flows across the lung structure during both the inhale and the exhale phase of the breath. 
Now, how is that possible? Well, the lungs themselves are not responsible for pushing and pulling air throughout the system. The actual lungs are rigid and stationary. To funnel air through, there are structures called air sacs. During inhalation, air is sucked into rear air sacs. At the same time, some air moves from these rear air sacs across the stationary lungs and into the front air sacs. Then, during exhalation, air is pushed out of the front air sacs and out of the critter. Additionally, more oxygen-rich air is pushed across the lung from the rear air sacs. This hyper-efficient lung structure meant that sauropods needed to expend less energy to breathe and could focus their energy elsewhere, like getting ginormous. We know that sauropods had bird-like lungs because their bones bear markers called pneumatic fenestrau. These are air pockets in the bones where air sacs would have been, and we see similar structures in the skeletons of modern-day birds. The existence of the air sacs is another huge reason that sauropods could get so big. These air sacs in the bones, or the pneumatization of their bones, considerably lighten their skeletons. It made their bones light, but rigid and still structurally strong, letting them achieve much greater sizes than terrestrial mammals or reptiles could with their solid, and therefore heavier bones. Plus, it took less energy to move the lighter skeleton, energy that could be focused instead on bulking the dinosaurs up. Plus, moving the skeleton generated less heat. Overheating is a big risk for big creatures, but the respiratory system helped keep them cool. The numerous air sacs throughout the body meant the internal surface area of sauropods was very large, therefore perfect for dispelling excess heat with every breath. This could have literally been a lifesaver. Thermoregulation is also part of the reason why blue whales got so big, except they got big for the opposite reason. Instead of their size helping them cool down, their bulk helped them keep warm. In winter waters, animals must have a bit of bulk on them so they don't bleed their body heat out into the water. Bodily bulk helps to store heat. But that's only a small reason why blue whales got so unfathomably massive. Really, that only explains why blue whales aren't the size of a toy poodle. Indeed, most marine mammals in the Arctic are magnitudes smaller than blue whales, and they bear the bitter cold just fine. So, what really drove blue whales to get so big? Blue whales are part of the group called baleen whales. Baleens are modified teeth that look sort of like combs, and the first baleen whales used them to filter feed, mostly on plankton. But then along came Rorquals, a lineage of the baleen whales. They ended up doing something very special. They developed a hunting technique called lunge feeding, which is like inverted suction. A whale takes a big gulp of critter-filled ocean water, and then they spit out the water. It's like dumping some bubble tea in your mouth, but spitting out the tea part and only eating the tapioca bubbles. Although ineffective for bubble tea, this technique opened up a lot of options for the Rorquals. It allowed them to eat bigger prey, like entire schools of fish, and, of course, krill. But krill, the blue whale's only food source, didn't always swarm the sea like they do today. Conditions for krill were brought about by a period of ice ages around 3 million years ago. There was a cycle where glacial sheets would extend down into the middle of North America, then retract and then expand repeatedly. Not only did this glacial ebb and flow give Canada and Wisconsin their beautiful smattering of lakes, but the process also triggered a shift to a more seasonal, cyclical climate. These shifting seasons reshaped the oceans and strengthened southerly winds, which, in turn, created upwelling zones. Upwelling zones are areas where wind blows water from the depths of the ocean back up to the surface. The bottom of the ocean is, of course, where aquatic critters go when they die. So this water is very nutrient-rich, and in this nutrient-laced water, krills bloom. However, upwelling zones only make up about 5% of the ocean's surface area, and krill blooms can often be few and far between. This means there can be an all-you-can-eat krill buffet with huge swaths of food deserts between it and the next one. So, blue whales have to pack on the pounds in case they go without food for long stretches of time, and also when they migrate. This is part of the reason blue whales had to put on so much bulk. But that's not the only reason. Part of the reason they got so big is because of, well, getting big. Let me explain. When blue whales started putting on bulk, they sacrificed mobility, which is a crucial component of lunge feeding. So, to compensate, they needed to make their mouths bigger so they could catch more krill per gulp. And now, blue whales take some truly big gulps. To catch krill, the whale will accelerate towards them with their mouth wide open with their giant tongue inverted to create a big sack. It's estimated they can gulp up to 20,000 liters of krill-laden water at once. That's enough water to sustain an average American's water needs for an entire month all in one gulp. 
And incredibly, each gulp contains an estimated half a million calories of krill. That's enough calories to sustain the average American for 20 minutes. Now, for blue whales to make their mouths bigger to take these gargantuan gulps, they had to make their entire bodies bigger. And their bigger bodies required more energy, and therefore more energy stores during potential food drought, which reduced maneuverability, which made whales need to make their mouths bigger. Which, well, you get the drift. Essentially, blue whales got so big because of this cycle. But this is a slight problem. Because they are such extreme specialists, anytime their niche is threatened, their only evolutionary choice is to double down and get even bigger. If krill become more scarce in order to survive, blue whales must get even bigger to store more energy during their droughts, and the cycle just continues. It's hard to say what the future and its ecological uncertainty will hold for blue whales, but they will always be remembered as some of the biggest creatures that ever lived. But there is one creature that dwarfs titanosaurs, and even blue whales. And that creature is, of course, your mother. And the reason she's so big? It's quite simple. Her heart had to expand to make room for all the love she has for you. Thanks for watching BioArk.